Perfect. Um, so a warm welcome to, to Katrien uh, once more. Uh, Katrien van Broek has a PhD in Educational Sciences uh, from the University of Leuven and a Master in Social Work from Gent University here in Belgium. Uh, and as an Associate Professor at Gent University Department of Political Sciences, uh, she focused on the role of teaching and learning in the pursuit of building a more sustainable world, um, where she's coordinating in the Center for Sustainable Development, the research line on sustainability education. Um, Katrien leads re research projects and international scientific networks on experiential learning in the context of sustainability transitions, um, sustainability in higher education, climate education, and challenge-based teaching on real-world sustainability problems. Um, and part of today's talk, or the, the focus of today's talk, will be also on her work as principal investigator of the ERC-funded Leicester project, where she's establishing a new research team focusing on learning in the view of sustainability transitions. Uh, and we are very excited to have Katrien joining us uh, to shed light on this particular topic. Um, so maybe just a short piece of, of housekeeping. Uh, we will have a presentation about 30, 35 minutes uh, by Katrien. And after that, we will move on to, to the Q&A. Um, so between the presentation and the Q&A, we'll have a very short break of one minute, where we will also post a link to you uh, where you can ask questions via that live ask tool. So via the link, I will, we will post in the chat um, so you can ask the questions and the, uh, we will have a moderated uh, Q&A then. Um, so without further ado, I will, I will give the virtual mic uh, to Katrien uh, and uh, the floor is all yours. Looking forward to it. Thank you very much, uh, Abel, for the introduction and, and uh, also your colleagues very much. Uh, thanks for inviting me to be part of this uh, exciting webinar series. Uh, it's really amazing to, to see all these initiatives being taken to, uh, to establish really a community of early career researchers in this uh, important field. So thanks a lot for all your uh, voluntary work uh, done on this. I will uh, start with sharing my screen for the presentation on learning and sustainability transitions. As uh, Abba said, indeed, uh, the focus of um, most of my research for uh, this moment. Um, and um, let's start maybe by looking at uh, research on learning uh, in the context of sustainability transitions a bit more widely than, than my own research. And a while ago, I did a search on the term learning in the EST website. Uh, yeah. The, the website of the S journal. And I was a bit surprised actually to find so many results because I knew that learning is quite omnipresent in sustainability transitions literature, but it turns out to be, the word turns out to be used uh, in more than half of the uh, papers of the journal. So that was uh, still a bit of a surprise, even though we knew that it was uh, important, an important topic uh, in the research field. There has also been, uh, this special issue that, that uh, has been published on it, uh, edited by Barbara van Mirlo and some uh, other colleagues. Um, and I will start by um, going into some findings from an um, explorative review of literature that we did in the context of a, a paper that uh, has been published within this uh, special issue. And what we saw in the uh, literature that we explored was that a lot of very good arguments were raised um, to explain why learning is important uh, in the context of sustainability transitions. And one of the arguments is that it's uh, actually a vital means for transitions, uh, especially because the, the challenge of building a more sustainable world is so complex. So we need to learn how to do it. It's also supposed or assumed to be important for uh, the emergence and maturation of uh, successful niches, for building societal intelligence, for learning how to govern sustainability transitions in a better way, and also for fostering the creativity that we need uh, in order to create transitions. Because if we want to radically change society, we will have to question what is taken for granted and create uh, a space for new practices, cultures and structures. And that uh, requires a lot of creativity and hence learning, it is argued. Uh, so a lot of good arguments for the importance of learning, but we also found some uh, important gaps in the state of the art of literature. Um, these three gaps, a lack of conceptual clarity, 
a rather weak empirical knowledge base so far, uh, and, and also the need for a suitable analytical framework. Uh, and I will go into this uh, in, in the subsequent slides. The lack of uh, conceptual clarity has been emphasized, for instance, also by Van Mierlo and Beers in uh, one of the articles in the special issue. And they argue that um, learning processes have hardly been conceptualized and that well-established research fields that are related to learning are, according to them, broadly ignored or loosely applied. And in another, in, in the editorial of the editors of this special issue, um, they say that uh, there is a, a need for conceptual work that goes beyond the superficial use of notions like social learning, double loop learning, uh, and that we, we need uh, more strong conceptual contributions. And what I would uh, add to that is that, um, in my view, it will be mainly important when, when we look at what is uh, available in current literature, uh, that it will be very important to avoid uh, the conflation of learning on the one hand and societal changes that may be the result of learning on the other hand. Because although both phenomena are quite entangled, uh, it's still two very different phenomena. And it would be a pity to, to conflate them and to assume, for instance, that uh, all the changes that are observed are the result of learning. So that was um, one of the observations of other authors, also of us, in, in uh, the special issue, uh, but also in earlier research on social learning, for instance, similar observations have been made. Then when it comes to um, the weak empirical knowledge base, uh, we could look at this quote of uh, Brown and colleagues that is uh, almost 10 years old now, but still quite valid today, uh, I think. Um, and they say that there's very little systematic study on learning processes in the course of implementation. So little attention for monitoring learning processes assessing the impacts of it and examining the conditions under which learning occurs or not and by what mechanisms um, that happens. And as a result of this, um, what we see is often that quite strong claims are made that people are learning, what they're learning, how they are learning, uh, but often without uh, convincing empirical evidence uh, of that learning. And for instance, empirical evidence of the fact that the changes that are observed are actually um, the result of learning. And because of this, both the content and the process of learning uh, risk to remain black boxed, um, just like the connections between learning and the change uh, resulting from it. And then um, a third uh, gap that we would like to address is um, the, the lack of a suitable analytical framework. So on the one hand, because of a lack of conceptual clarity, it uh, becomes very difficult um, to do detailed empirical analysis because it becomes difficult to, to operationalize uh, the process and outcomes of uh, learning and sustainability transitions. And on the other hand, because of a lack of empirical knowledge, it also uh, becomes more difficult to, to further progress the conceptualization and understanding of learning and transitions. So what is most needed is a, a suitable analytical framework and some uh, suitable methods uh, for empirical analysis so that we can uh, both uh, do more empirical research and also progress theory development. And we've been trying together with colleagues uh, to put some first steps in, in that uh, direction, only first steps because uh, I consider the, the challenge in front of us to be yeah, quite big and, and what we have done so far together with colleagues are, uh, first of all, um, yeah, this article where we did the explorative review of literature and also introduced a conceptual framework. Then in a second step, um, we presented an empirical study uh, and an analytical approach to, to conduct it uh, in order to investigate what people learn and what's the potential for transitions of these learning processes. And then a third paper that was presented at the IST conference last year uh, addresses how learning is facilitated um, and tries in that sense to create knowledge that gives uh, some guidance for improving learning processes. 
And it's actually the, these three papers that I will try to very briefly uh, summarize today. Um, first, uh, yeah, the first paper, I already talked about the review of literature, but the conceptual framework, um, I will present this very briefly, but the, the theoretical background um, that I use in, in all my research on learning and transitions is very much inspired by transactional pragmatism and mainly the work of John Dewey. And central to this uh, transactional theory of uh, learning that we use is the assumption that uh, it's always a disturbance of habits that is a crucial driver for learning. Um, and in pragmatism, the assumption is that in everyday life, uh, people often act without reflecting. We have a sort of routinous way of uh, being um, in everyday life, and it's only when our habitual ways of thinking and acting are disturbed that we encounter a problematic situation which, which um, forces us to stop and think, to um, engage in reflection and inquiry, experimentation perhaps, to try to find a solution to overcome the problematic situation. And sometimes we can find that quite easily uh, with the help of existing habits. And what we see then is what we can call a short learning loop. And we just easily overcome a problematic situation and our existing habits are consolidated or enriched. Sometimes it requires a bit more work and then uh, it needs an inquiry with experimentation, uh, which will result in uh, new knowledge, skills and values. Uh, and that can, uh, in that sense, lead to a, a fundamental transformation of habits or the formation of a new habit. So this uh, transactional theory investigates learning always in terms of the formation and transformation of habits in and through uh, practices that are aimed at solving sustainability problems. Um, and therefore, I thought it could be a quite interesting um, yeah, theoretical approach to study learning and transitions. Um, and very central uh, in this transactional approach is the focus on the dynamic interplay between persons and their environment as something that changes uh, simultaneously and reciprocally. So some uh, learning research focuses almost exclusively on intrapersonal aspects, how people create uh, new knowledge by building on previous knowledge. And that's a very important aspect of learning. But another important aspect is uh, all kinds of aspects of the environment. Interpersonal can be um, interactions between people, between peers, with the facilitator, etc. cetera. Um, but also institutional aspects like worldviews, discourses, epistemological beliefs, curricula, etc or even the material world, uh, all kinds of physical objects like books, vegetables, infrastructures, etc. And the influence of the environment is very much uh, highlighted in sociocultural learning research. And what makes the transactional approach um, quite specific is that we focus on the dynamic interplay between the intrapersonal and aspects of the environment. And I will go into details on, on uh, or show uh, with examples how exactly we do that. Um, and that will be done uh, through this second paper that is focused on what is learned and uh, what uh, is the transition potential of the learning outcomes. Um, but before uh, going into the empirical analysis and examples, it's important to, um, to highlight something in advance. Um, I think we all know that transition processes are um, always normative, that they are very open-ended and have a very long-term character. And because of these characteristics of transitions, it is actually impossible to predict how all kinds of learning processes that are very much micro practices today uh, will certainly and directly lead to long-term macro-societal transitions. That's really yeah, impossible to, to predict uh, for sure. Um, but that does not mean that we can't do anything because what is possible is to observe practices that we can see today and to identify in these practices uh, those actions that have the potential to influence or to accelerate or reorient uh, transitions. 
So that's a sort of disclaimer before I start to present um, the results, because it's not so that we have like clear empirical evidence on how these actions in a specific learning practice uh, have or have not resulted in those major societal transitions. That's not really possible, but um, I will try to show what can be done uh, that uh, hopefully leads us uh, in the direction of developing knowledge that can still be helpful in that uh, perspective. And uh, the focus of this paper was very much on what and how people learn in view of sustainability transitions. And we analyzed that in two steps. First, opening up the black box of learning processes. And then secondly, um, assessing uh, the potential of that sort of learning for um, sustainability transitions. And the case is a series of workshops that was organized by the city of Ghent uh, in Belgium. And it, uh, it was a series of workshops where um, a variety of participants created scenarios for short food supply chain initiatives, difficult to pronounce. <laughs> um, and they wanted to create that sort of um, short of, of initiatives at a business to business level. So they wanted to scale up um, the food that is traded in that way uh, by establishing connections between farmers on the one hand, and then uh, all kinds of large kitchens and restaurants, schools, hospitals, retail uh, on the other hand. And they developed three scenarios in order to make that uh, happen, a farmer's network, a knowledge platform, and a distribution platform. And from the start, it was obvious that uh, one of these scenarios would actually be funded as a pilot project uh, afterwards. And the one that was funded in the end was the distribution platform. And that's also the workshops uh, that, that resulted in that uh, are also the workshops where the empirical examples that I will present uh, will come from. So the first step, opening up the black box of the learning process, um, we did that by um, using an analytical approach that combines this transactional theory of learning that I just presented uh, with the analytical method PEA, practical epistemology analysis. And this, um, this method has a number of key uh, concepts such as gaps, relations, encounters, stand fast, and the procedure is very much that we start with identifying gaps in conversations between people or in, in the actions of people. And a gap is a situation where we can see that uh, people can't continue habitually, that they have to, that they encounter something that makes them to stop and, and prevents them uh, to smoothly continue their um, activity. Uh, so it, it sort of represents uh, a disturbance of habits that results in a problematic situation. Um, and gaps become visible when people start to hesitate, disagree with one another, ask for help, cannot immediately come up with the answer on a question, etc. And when we see such gaps, we can try to reconstruct uh, the learning process by identifying the relations that people create between that what causes the gap, the new thing in, uh, in the present uh, encounter and what they encounter in, in the situation that is new for them. And they will create a relation between that and something that already stands fast for them. So their previous experience, previous, previous knowledge, skills, beliefs, etc. And by tracing uh, that sort of relations that people try to create to overcome a gap, we can also trace the privileging. And that's a, a concept that is used by Wirch. Um, and privileging means a dynamic process of inclusion and exclusion that steers the meaning making and therefore also the learning uh, in a certain direction towards certain outcomes. And what we see in conversations is that um, it often happens that certain ideas or questions or concepts are uh, taken into account and the privileging are seen as something that is relevant that should be taken into account while others are excluded from the privileging. They are neglected or disregarded uh, and, and they do not become part of the joint meaning making process. And by tracing the privileging through these gaps and relations, 
um, we can actually see how learning has happened and, and we can conclude that people have uh, learned something if they manage to success, successfully bridge uh, a gap uh, and, and that we can see um, as soon as they are able to proceed again. This is a bit of an abstract um, formulation, but I hope it will become a bit more clear with some examples. Um, and before we, we go to, to three uh, empirical examples, it's still uh, important to say that the gaps that we can see, and especially in, in these sort of complex uh, informal learning practices, um, they often emerge as a kind of a mess of yeah, multiple entangled gaps, you could say. Like for instance, we could observe an activity workshops where people come together to create um, scenarios for such a distribution platform and they don't have the scenarios yet so it's a gap for them they can't immediately come up with an answer and within these workshops we could for instance observe a subgroup discussion where they will uh, try to answer the question how to organize the platform's communication also something that they do not have ready-made answers for so a gap and within the subgroup discussion they can uh, suddenly start to discuss the issue of uh, having very diverse target groups with very diverse needs and the challenges involved in communicating towards these different groups. And even within that gap, uh, and that's the first example that we will see, uh, they can start to discuss um, communication about the price, for instance, and uh, the need to take into account that the price difference of organic, organic food, for instance, uh, has a much bigger impact on a, a modest bistro or a large kitchen than it would have um, for a top end restaurant. So this is an embedded um, yeah, set of gaps uh, that can occur in, in complex uh, learning situations. And even while they discuss this, it could happen, for instance, that someone uses a word that someone else doesn't uh, understand. So small um, sub gaps or sub problematic situations can, can pop up all the time. Um, and this is a, an example where uh, two participants end up in an endless discussion, you could say, about how to deal uh, with these price differences that are very uh, different for uh, diverse target audiences. And they really don't agree. Like uh, one of the persons, Emma, who works at an organic farm, really emphasizes the need to make a distinction uh, in the quality of carrots. Quality carrots on the one hand and um, large scale carrots on the other hand. And William absolutely does not agree. Uh, and he says, but everyone buys their vegetables in the supermarket and everyone likes them. Yes, but not me, she says. So she doesn't agree. And then it's like, yeah, but you are an exception. The mainstream persons go to the store, buy their vegetables, and they eat it and like it. Yes, Emma replies, but uh, there is still a group uh, that doesn't do that. And uh, it's a group that is growing and that is changing, but there aren't that many uh, and they continue like uh, forever. And you can see at the end of, uh, of the, conversation, they, they still do not um, agree. And you can see uh, that they uh, very often use the word but. So as soon as one of them tries to include something in the privileging uh, process, the other one immediately excludes it. Uh, so it becomes a kind of struggle uh, over what should be included in the privileging. And as a result, the gap actually lingers. They do not manage to, to overcome it through some sort of uh, inquiry process because it remains undecided and they end up in a sort of yes or no game. Um, and they don't arrive at any collectively shared definition of what is actually the problem. And because of that, they also can't start to experiment with, with uh, possible solutions or to think over possible uh, solutions that might uh, lead to a transformation of habits. They just remain stuck in a problematic situation. Uh, and maybe one of them or both of them might have learned something at an individual level that they may, for instance, have 
learn to create better arguments for their standpoint, but at the collective level, we can't uh, conclude that they have um, actually learned to overcome the problematic situation that they were facing here. A second example shows uh, something very, uh, very different. It's a, a discussion on how to match the supply and demand uh, side of short food supply chains. Uh, and it's a discussion about seasonal food. And it starts with a gap uh, that is uh, emerging when John, who is a cook and a, a chef in a large kitchen of an elderly home, says that, yeah, but if a cook says one day in June that he needs red cabbage today, and all the farmers and the platform uh, who are located in East Flanders, uh, they don't have red cabbages in June. So then the platform, according to him, must be able to deliver it. So what happens here is that uh, John experiences a gap, a disturbance of his habits, uh, because he sees, he encounters in this situation that all the farmers that will deliver to the platform are local farmers and they have seasonal food. Uh, and it clashes with his uh, habitual way of thinking that uh, every cook should be able to, to buy um, yeah, whatever they need every day of the year. And what we see is uh, Hannah reacting to it by saying, but short chain is also seasonal in the end. So in June, you will indeed not be able to find red cabbages. And another participant steps in, yeah, indeed, then it's asparagus. And Hannah says, yes, that's how it is. So what we see here is a gap that is bridged very easily, actually, uh, by relying on, on uh, existing habits. So they consolidate the habitual belief that short food supply chain is uh, per definition seasonal food. So by doing that, um, the, the concern that John raised uh, in the beginning is excluded uh, from the privileging process. And they find the sort of easy way out of a problematic situation without really uh, entering into an inquiry and experimentation. And in this instance, also John did not um, protest against this or try to re-include uh, his concern. It was just a gap that was easily solved and they could continue uh, after this situation. And then uh, the third example starts with the same person, John, um, who uh, experiences another gap. And uh, it's in the same discussion on uh, matching supply and demand. And uh, here we can see that he says like, he encounters uh, the fact that the, the vegetables in the distribution platform would be like not processed vegetables coming, like harvest coming straight from the field. And he says like, I don't have the space in my kitchen where I can peel potatoes. I do no longer have a space where I can process my vegetables. And another one, Eric says, yes, yes, I understand that. So by confirming it, he includes it um, in, the, in the privileging process and the meaning making. 20 years ago, John replies, I could do that, but now it all disappeared. And then Eric responds, yes, but that's what I mean by stepping back in time. That was something that he, uh, that he argued for earlier on in uh, the discussion. But you can't do that anymore, John reacts. You can't reverse that. It's not possible. And then a third person steps in and he says, not possible. That's what he encountered uh, new in the situation. He says, not possible, not entirely, but there are some opportunities. And this is then encountered by John who reacts. There are certainly some opportunities, for instance, uh, with salad or shikari, it's not uh, too much work, but it's about those other do you see in it? And William answers, I know a farmer who has an agreement with two hospitals and he delivers the whole harvest to these two hospitals. Uh, he works with a factory to peel it. And I'm just saying this, he argues, because the peeling of the harvest could be an activity that could be included in the distribution platform. So what we see here is what we could call a long learning loop. They encounter a problematic situation and they actually uh, start an inquiry process. They try to learn to find a way out of it uh, through 
the interplay between what they encounter as new and what stands fast for them already, their own earlier experiences and knowledge. Um, and here we can see that this results on the one hand in a transformation of habits from the perspective of this platform in the making, you could see the idea of including a new activity, the peeling of the harvest as a transformation of habit. On the other hand, uh, it's also a consolidation of the chef's existing habit of um, working with processed food. Uh, but all in all, you could see this as a, an example where they find a creative way out of a problematic situation. And then uh, this brings us to the second step, like how can we assess this uh, in terms of the potential to result in a sustainability transition? Um, here we use an analytical approach where we draw on the multi-level perspective on transitions. And what we try to do is to analyze whether and how the participants are using transition elements as resources in the learning process. And transition elements could be, for instance, characteristics of the regime or existing practices of niches, etc. Uh, and then we will look at how these transition elements function uh, in the privileging process. Do they function as a lock-in, as a window of opportunity, and how this steers the learning process in a direction that can have less or more potential to enable a transition. We can't see how it results directly and immediately into a transition, but we can assess uh, with the help of earlier research on transitions, we can assess the potential for it. Um, and in this example, we have used existing MLP studies and also review on existing MLP studies where they have already identified characteristics of the socio-technical regime, which is for instance, using uh, processed food and having uh, a so-called eternal summer diet where you can buy any seasonal or non-seasonal local or exotic food uh, the whole year through um, in supermarkets. That's some examples of um, how the current regime looks like. It has some internal contradictions, for instance, ecological impact, some landscape trends that are relevant like globalization, climate change, uh, pressure from citizens that want uh, something better for animals and for the environment and also existing niches like fair trade, organic agriculture, short food supply chain, community supported agriculture, et cetera. We know already a lot about how this um, agri-food system uh, more or less looks like. And with the help of that sort of um, earlier research, we can try to make sense of uh, what happens uh, in these learning processes. And the first example, uh, we saw this struggle about what should be included and excluded in the privileging process. And you could see it actually as a struggle uh, over the extent to which the platform that they are creating should, uh, whether or not, differ radically from the currently dominant regime. And we can see that both William and Emma use transition elements uh, as a resource in their argumentation, but they refer to very different transition elements. William is referring to, to the dominant consumer preferences of buying food in supermarkets. And Emma is referring to all kinds of niche practices and the fact that there is an audience that has uh, also niche preferences and habits. But in the end, uh, the outcome remains undecided here. We can't say anything about uh, the potential for transitions because um, yeah, there is hardly any learning taking place here. And then in the second example, we, they, they come to the conclusion that short food supply chain is um, seasonal food. So this is a, yeah, a conclusion to break with uh, the regime characteristic of this eternal summer diet. Um, and that's actually an explicit choice that they collectively make uh, to provide an alternative uh, for this existing regime, at least when it comes to this aspect. Um, because they find it problematic. Um, whether or not this will have the potential to contribute to, to a transition will also depend on other sustainability criteria, like short chain is one thing, uh, but it's also about a viable income for farmers, about sustainable uh, ways of producing food, distributing it, etc. Uh, and on the other hand, it will also depend on whether or not the niche practice that they are developing 
um, will will have a sufficient scale um, to to yeah have enough impact on the total volume of uh, food that will be produced and traded uh, through the, the uh, short chain. So if they are really strict on seasonal food, it might be that um, yeah, they will have uh, not enough customers and that it will, will not provide an alternative in the end. And then in the third example, we saw that uh, the regime characteristic of using uh, all kinds of processed food actually also influenced the infrastructure of large kitchens. It's a form of path dependency. Um, and this is included in the privileging. So it, it functions as a lock-in. Uh, and in, in the example that I showed, we can see that they, uh, that they created a suggestion to overcome it. So, um, they, they suggest that the processing of the harvest could be an activity of the distribution platform. And now we could yeah, interpret this in two ways. Like on the one hand, you could say that this is actually consolidating the current regime because it's a way of adjusting to, to its characteristics. On the other hand, it might also be seen as something that could open up a space for re a reconfiguration of this regime by bypassing lock-ins. Uh, and by developing a niche that may be strong enough, have sufficient scale, maturity, et cetera, uh, to provide an alternative. Unfortunately, we have not been able to continuing um, to follow up um, this example, but, but in this case as well, a lot will also depend on how the processing of the harvest that would be given shape. Will it be with a lot of uh, single use plastics to package everything, or would it be, uh, done within social economy and with uh, fair trade um, characteristics. There's a lot of different ways of organizing that activity, but here it was just creating a scenario and we couldn't see how it would um, eventually take shape. A last step then in the analysis that I will address briefly is um, how learning is facilitated. Um, and um, here we will focus on how the work of facilitators of workshops, for instance, but also all kinds of other facilitators and sustainability transition initiatives, how their work can help the participants to jointly, jointly develop pathways towards more sustainability. And uh, to do so requires a lot of work, both in the planning and the design and the preparation of the learning processes, but also uh, a lot of interventions in the actual performance of it. Um, and referring back to this uh, transactional learning theory, we could understand the facilitation of learning as um, trying to govern the privileging process in connection to a certain purpose. So it's a matter of developing a specific attentiveness, like trying to make the participants to be attentive for certain aspects and not other, uh, and also um, engaging in a specific activity. I have to keep this very brief here, but it's uh, explained in more detail in the paper that is available online. Um, and we, we created, uh, an analytical method for that that is inspired by dramaturgical analysis, a transactional perspective, and didactic research. And the dramaturgical, dramaturgical analysis means that we will focus very much on what the setting does to a practice. And we use some metaphors from drama referring to the scripting, staging, and performance. It's also described in the article. Um, the transactional perspective I've uh, explained before, but uh, important here is that we will not only look at what a setting does with people, so what the environment does with the persons, but also what people do with the setting uh, simultaneously and reciprocally. That's what makes it uh, transactional. And then we used uh, didactic research to gain insights in the influence of what facilitators do on uh, what participants learn. So you could see it uh, actually also as a teaching theory. And we do this usually in three steps. First, by uh, identifying the preparatory work of facilitators uh, to, to do the scripting and staging of a setting. Secondly, to investigate uh, the learning in action with the help of PEA, as we have done in the other article as well. And then in a third step um, that's focused on revealing the impact 
in this learning process the impact of uh, the actions of a facilitator and we call that uh, facilitator move analysis and it's on this that I will um, focus here with some brief examples. Um, earlier research, uh, mainly on teaching, um, has resulted in an overview of very different sorts of moves that teachers or facilitators can make, either to add something to the participants' attention, uh, to direct uh, their attentiveness, or to deepen their inquiry. There's a whole um, overview of that, and I will just give some brief examples. Um, but in, uh, in one of the workshops, we saw a discussion between uh, people on how to promote the short food supply chain initiatives. And Fred is actually a quite famous uh, chef in a top-end restaurant. And he keeps on arguing again and again that it's all a matter of emphasizing the high quality of the products and being proud to work with them. And Gabby is another participant and uh, she's a dairy farmer. Uh, and she has just said that Fred's argument uh, does not hold in, in her case because she produces milk and um, the convenience of using prepackaged sterilized milk uh, is according to her much more attractive for customers than the so-called higher quality milk that has a limited shelf life and uh, yeah that she experiences that uh, this is really a problematic situation because what, what Fred um, sees as a solution from her perspective it's not a solution at all and Fred continues repeatedly to raise the argument of quality and pride and then uh, the facilitator intervenes and she says, so apart from that, because you, Fred and Anna, someone who shared uh, the same opinion, uh, you have now indicated um, these and these things, uh, but, and then she turns to Gabi, are there also other obstacles for your company uh, to fully switch to the short chain? And then Fred interrupts. And he says, uh, if it would become attractive, in fact, the purchase would become very constant. Uh, and what we see here um, in the intervention of the facilitator is that she tries to make a reorienting move. She tries to, tries to shift uh, the attentiveness uh, of the participants to obstacles uh, and also to the specificity of uh, Gabby's company. But it fails in the first instance, so she has to do it uh, again. So she repeats, yeah, yeah, she says, you have made that point. But now I was wondering if there were any other doubts that Gabi experiences uh, about switching to the short chain. And then uh, it actually does have the, the desired effect because uh, she shifts indeed to um, paying attention to, to all kinds of obstacles such as running a busy company in the startup phase, uh, encountering a lot of things that you do not know anything about, et cetera. And a second example goes back Sorry. to the... I'm almost the word 35, yeah, perfect. Yeah. A second example goes back to the, um, the kitchen infrastructure that we discussed uh, before, that he doesn't have the space in the kitchen uh, to peel vegetables. And there we saw that at a certain point, uh, when they started to agree like, yeah, there are some opportunities, but not for everything. Then the facilitator intervenes by asking, what opportunities do you see in it? And this is uh, what we call a specifying move, because what we see here is that it has a specific effect um, on what the participants do afterward. And uh, what they do is specifying opportunities. I know a farmer who has an agreement with hospitals, works with a factory to peel it, et cetera. And by doing that, by making it more specific, they actually realize the, um, the purpose uh, of the whole activity to develop scenarios that are quite well developed and, and supported so that they could uh, receive funding as a pilot uh, project. And throughout this workshop, we saw this uh, facilitator making a lot of that sort of moves which resulted in a, a quite detailed uh, proposal of this scenario. Um, and it might have contributed to the fact that it was that one that received funding in the end. So to conclude, what, what have we done so far? 
Um, we've been employing, operationalizing, operationalizing and fine-tuning uh, some theoretical models and analytical methods uh, that we could use to create knowledge about, on the one hand, whether, what and how people learn, but also on uh, the effect on, of the work of facilitators on the outcome of learning processes. Um, we've been able to answer some questions like what is privileged, which habits are transformed, which encounters have influenced it, or um, how has the work of the facilitator influenced that? And we have some empirical evidence, but I would call it uh, quite preliminary empirical evidence of how learning happens in transitions because it stays very much within specific cases. Um, and uh, it sheds some light uh, mainly on some interesting pathways that I think we should uh, explore more in the future. And to end with it, if these were the first steps, what could be next? Um, I think what is, will be important is to further develop uh, the theoretical and methodological work, for instance, to develop a theory of collective learning. Uh, I think that could be something that will be very important uh, in the future but also to create empirical insights that move across cases or beyond like a single case perspective. Um, and, and what would ideally be needed is that we could identify some patterns, for instance, in how specific teacher moves or facilitator moves lead to specific results on how, for instance, certain disturbances of habits lead to specific types of inquiries that have, have more or less potential for transitions. And when, when I ended the preliminary research project or the small research project uh, that I presented now today, I was mainly left a bit frustrated uh, about all the things that remained to be done and that were not possible to do um, within a very small project. And then I discovered the ERC that is actually um, funding uh, what they call frontier research. Uh, and they, they say they call this research that is at and beyond the frontier of knowledge and that is high risk and high gain. And they give quite a lot of funding for that. And I thought like, okay, maybe that's what we need to, to investigate learning and transition. And then um, I submitted a proposal which uh, to my, surprise really resulted in uh, the funding of this LESTRA project on learning in view of sustainability transitions that we have now started and, and will continue to work on um, in the future. And I have, um, I will leave it here um, for today by just maybe highlighting the, the main challenge in, in this project, which is very much focused on uh, bridging or, or connecting like the, the micro scale of uh, learning processes and practices that we can observe today and this macro phenomenon of um, yeah, large scale uh, societal transition. So this is really the high risk, high gain uh, focus of the Lestra project. If you have questions on that, I can address it uh, later on. Uh, but for now, I will just uh, leave it by this. Here are some references uh, that I've used in the presentation. Uh, and this is a thank you to the European uh, Research Council for the funding. Uh, you can see here also my contacts, also the names of the other people that uh, are joining in the LESTRA project team. And of course, uh, thank you very much uh, for your attention. And I'm looking forward to the Q&A now. Thanks, Catherine.